Well, if we could uh, open our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 11, and verse 16. The book of Romans, chapter 11, and verse 16. If God allows it, we'll make it through verse 24 this morning, but at least verse 22. Uh, The title of our message is Truth from an Olive Tree. A more generic title is Is God Through with the Jew, Part 3, but that gets old after a while, so try to be a little more colorful. Truth uh, from an Olive Tree. Of course, I want to wish everybody a Happy New Year. And I can't think of a better place to start the new year than in the Lord's house, worshiping and reflecting upon Him. Well, we are in the midst of a series of studies through the book of Romans, which is about the divine righteousness revealed. We took a break last week to give a special Christmas message, but we're back to it this week in the book of Romans. We know Paul wrote the book, and it was written... Two Roman believers by Paul from Corinth about A.D. 57 for the purpose of laying a strong doctrinal foundation in a church that really was a vibrant church and a growing church but really needed a better grounding in terms of doctrine. The book of Romans is about the righteousness of God and how it's been revealed. How we get the righteousness of God and how we live it out. It's a very formal book, as we have mentioned. And we are in part five of the book, a section of the book called Sovereignty, chapters 9 through 11. It's a part of the book that looks very strange to us because it's very Jewish in its orientation. And many people will just skip right over these chapters. But what I have tried to communicate is Romans 9, 10, and 11 is not some kind of side thought or digression. But it is critical to Paul's point that he is making. Because at the end of Romans 8, Paul has mentioned to us that we are the recipients of believers in Jesus Christ of unfathomable promises. Promises which are so certain that God places them in the, in the past tense. Even though from our standpoint they haven't materialized yet. You'll notice that word glorified. That's the past tense. Although we have not yet been glorified. But from God's point of view, the promise is a done deal. God can speak of it as if it's already happened. The promises of God. And yet, there would perhaps be an objector in the congregation which would say, well, how can I trust God's promises to me if God can't even keep his promises to the nation of Israel? Because it looked as if God had broken his word to Israel, that Old Testament nation. After all, Israel had turned Christ over to the Romans for execution, and it looked as if God had divorced or washed his hands of Israel. Israel was in unbelief. Today, Israel remains in unbelief. So the point of these chapters is how can God be trusted to be faithful to us if he has been unfaithful to Israel? And thus, Paul explains, hold the phone on that one, God is not unfaithful to Israel. Israel's promises are not in a state of cancellation, they are in a state of postponement. So Romans 9, Israel in the past, elected. Romans 10, Israel in the present, rejected. And it's in Romans 10 that Paul really begins to explain why the nation of Israel, that Jewish first century nation that had the Old Testament, had the promises of God, could not recognize Jesus Christ when he showed up on their doorstep. The issue is they wanted to come to God by way of works instead of faith, and so they tripped right over Jesus Christ. 
And then Paul moves on to Romans 11. Israel in the future, though, will be accepted. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. Romans 11, as Paul wraps up his thoughts on the nation of Israel. Romans 11 basically has five parts to it. Part 1, Israel's rejection is not total, verses 1 through 10. Part 2, God used Israel's rejection of Jesus to bless the Gentiles, verses 11 through 15. Part 3, the section we're in this morning, is Israel's covenants guarantee her restoration, verses 16 through 24. Part 4, Israel's restoration in the future will be certain, verses 25 through 32. And Paul can't help but explode into a doxology, which is a hymn of praise or glorification to God at the end of this chapter, verses 33 through 36, because God's character is vindicated. Whatever God has promised to do for anybody, including Israel, will happen. It may not happen on our timetable, but it will happen. Because God is not a God that can lie. So anything that God has promised me in this book will materialize one day. It's just a matter of when. So we looked at Romans 11, verses 1 through 10, and that's where Paul began to explain that Israel's rejection is not total. Paul began to develop the idea of a remnant of Jews that had come to Christ. And Paul's point in this section is simply that if God had washed his hands of Israel because of their rejection of Jesus, there would be no Jews in Christ. You would have no Jewish salvation in any sense. And Paul says that's wrong because I myself am a Jew who has believed in Jesus. And there is a remnant of believing Jews even to this day, Paul says. It's not the majority of the Jews, but there are some. And so that in and of itself is proof that God is not through with the Jew. Then Paul, we saw, not last week, but the previous week, moved into verses 11 through 15, where Paul begins to explain that God turned lemons into lemonade. God used something bad, Israel's rejection of Jesus, to bring forth something good. God used Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ to bless the Gentiles. Because the Jews turned Christ over to the Romans for crucifixion, the mechanism was in place whereby the sin debt of the world would be paid for, thus opening up salvation to the Gentiles of all ages. So even though something tragic happened, God turned it around for good. Do you recall that scripture in the book of Genesis, chapter 50, I think it's verse 20, where Joseph finally confronts his brothers, and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? For good. God took a lemon and turned it into lemonade. God took Joseph's betrayal into Egypt by his brothers, and God put the mechanism in place whereby God would use that negative event from the human point of view to ultimately rescue Israel from famine, if you know the Joseph story. And so the Jews, just based on that story, would understand that God can do this. He can take a negative decision, a rebellious decision, and turn it around for good. And that is what has happened with salvation. Now we move into part 3, verses 16 through 24, where we learn, beginning this morning, that Israel's covenants guarantee her future restoration. Now, what do we mean by these covenants. I would uh, refer you to lesson number 22 that we did in the book of Romans. And the date I have for that is October 23rd, 2011. By the way, as some of you may know or may not know, you can get all of these messages online. Also, if you want to get any message 
for any Sunday, all you do is put your name on a sign-up sheet that's at the right hand, uh, on your right as you're going out the door there. And you could sign up for any message you want, and we'll have those for you the following week. But in that particular message, we explained these covenants that the God of the universe entered into with a man named Abraham, a covenant. A covenant is a, we could put it this way, in a legal sense, a contract. But this covenant is one way. These are things that God has obligated himself to do for Israel. He has obligated himself to give to them land, seed or descendants, and a blessing. Land, seed, blessing. That's what you find in the Abrahamic covenant. This one-way, unilateral, unconditional covenant that God entered into with the chosen people. A series of covenantal promises that looked as if they would never happen. From the perspective of Paul's audience, it looked like these promises had been broken. From the perspective of many people, even in the year 2011, it looks like God has forgotten these promises. And yet Paul is beginning to explain that God has not forgotten these promises. Because Israel has a covenant, it is the only nation in the history of mankind with a covenant from God God one day is going to make good on what he has promised. Is God through with the Jew? No. Is Israel's rejection of Jesus something that has made Israel's spiritual state irretrievable? The answer is no. And this is what Paul begins to develop in verses 16 through 24. And so he uses three illustrations to get this point across. Illustration number one is the first piece and a lump of dough, verse 16a. Illustration number two is the root and the branches of a generic tree, just a tree in general, verse 16b. And his third illustration is the natural and the unnatural branches of an olive tree, verses 17 through 24. So notice, if you will, Paul's first illustration. Notice what he says, verse 16. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. In other words, God started off Israel on the right track with promises. And because God pays for what he orders, you know, some people go into a restaurant and they order a bunch of food, and they forgot their credit card or they forgot their checkbook and they can't pay for what they ordered. You see, God is not like that. Whatever God orders, he'll pay for. Whatever he promises will come into existence. The first piece of dough is holy. That's the covenants. And so the rest of the lump of dough, that would be the nation of Israel as a whole, will one day come back to Jesus Christ. It's just a matter of when. Now he moves into the second illustration, and that's the root and branches of a generic tree. And notice what he says in the second half of verse 16. If the root is holy, the branches are holy too. It's the same point. God's initial work with Israel was holy. They were given a formal covenant from God, and therefore the entire nation is holy unto God. God will bring that nation back into the fold. The foundation is good. So therefore, God will make good on what he has obligated himself to do. You know, foundations are a funny thing. We uh, own a house in Dallas. That's the house we lived in uh, before I moved to Houston. And Dallas is well known for its foundation problems. You can buy a house and suddenly the ground shifts underneath the house ever so slightly and cracks start to appear in the wall. So it doesn't matter how nice the furniture is. It doesn't matter what color the wallpaper is. It doesn't matter what color the carpet is and how nice it looks. If the foundation is wrong, the whole house suffers. You see? 
And what Paul is communicating here is Israel currently is in a state of unbelief, but her foundation is right. And so because the foundation is right and because the foundation is so predominant, it's just a matter of time before God makes good on his promises to national Israel. He has not forgotten. God has not forgotten about Israel, although Israel has forgotten about God. It's an astounding truth. Now Paul moves on to his third illustration. And he spends the most of of his time on this third illustration. And this has to do with the natural and the unnatural branches of an olive tree. One of the scriptures that I kept thinking about as I was studying this chapter this week is Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 which says for I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus you may have had a terrible year uh, an unspiritual year perhaps a sinful year a selfish year And yet, if you are in Christ, and because God pays for what he orders, he is going to bring even you, even myself, to that state of glorification one day. What God started, he finishes. You know, in my house, I've got a lot of unfinished projects. Things I start to build, and because I have no skill in that, it's left half built. Uh, books I start to read, I get bored with the book and quit in the middle of the book or 25% into the book. I mean, there's a lot of things I start I never finish. And yet what we're learning is God is not that way. Whatever God began, he finishes. And I praise the Lord for that because that's a blueprint, that's a prototype of our future glorification with him. And what Paul is simply expressing is God is that way with this nation that he started. This wayward, backslidden, blind, Christ-rejecting nation. God is at work even with them to bring them to a point of faith in Jesus Christ. The natural and the unnatural branches. So we have in verses 17 through 24 this uh, olive tree. The olive tree represents the Abrahamic covenant. The promise that God entered into with Abraham, guaranteeing to Israel land, seed, and blessing. These very promises that have been covenanted to that nation that seem to have been canceled from the human perspective. And Paul in verses 17 through 24 breaks down his discussion of the olive tree this way. He gives, number one, a warning against Gentile pride, verses 17 through 22. Now, what is a Gentile? A Gentile is a non-Jew. A Gentile is somebody who's not Jewish, not a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet, is somebody who has, in the age of the church, trusted in Jesus Christ. They have trusted in the very Messiah that Israel rejected. That's who we are as the church. We are trusting in the Messiah that Israel rejected. And there's a very strong exhortation to those of us that are Gentile believers not to be arrogant. Verses 17 through 22. And then Paul, in verses 23 through 24, will begin to talk about an anticipation of Jewish salvation, verses 23 through 24. But notice, if you will, uh, verses 17 through 22. Verses 17 through 22 breaks down this way. We have the fact of Gentile inclusion. That we as Gentiles have been brought into the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. We have number two, a warn, that's in verse 17. Number two, a warning very strong against Gentile pride, verse 18. Number three, we have a warning against a Gentile misconception, verses 19 through 21. 
And then finally, number four, Paul brings his thoughts to a conclusion concerning a warning against Gentile pride. But notice what he says here in verse 17. Here he's talking about the fact of Gentile inclusion. And notice what he says in verse 17, Romans 11. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being wild uh, olive or olive branches were grafted in among them and become a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Now, in this passage, he mentions three things. Number one, natural branches, branches from this olive tree that have been broken off. Those branches that have been broken off is a reference to Jewish unbelievers. They have been, because of their Christ rejection, removed for a season from the blessings of the olive tree, from the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. And then he mentions number two, unnatural or wild branches that have been brought into the tree. Now, who are these wild, unnatural branches that have been brought into the tree? Who is this group of people who have become blessed by the Abrahamic covenant because of their faith in the Messiah that that Israel rejected? That group of people is us, Gentile Christians. We are these uh, wild, unnatural branches that have been grafted in, if you will, to the olive tree. What you see there is just a little picture. I think uh, I got this from Dr. J. Quine, and uh, I think it's a good picture which illustrates the point that we're trying to make. You'll notice at the bottom left the branches that have been cut off. Those are the natural branches. Uh, those are the olive branches that have been cut off. That is the unbelieving state of the Jew today. Any Jew that rejects Jesus Christ is part of those branches that have been removed. They have been severed from the nurturing sap of the tree. They have been temporarily removed from the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant because they would not, Romans 10, come to Christ by way of faith. So they have been cut off, removed, in a state of non-spiritual blessings. And in their place have been grafted in these wild, unnatural branches. And that would be the predominantly Gentile church. Gentiles who have trusted in the very Messiah that Israel has rejected. And consequently, number three, we have become partakers. Very end of verse 17. Partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree. We as Gentiles have become blessed by the Abrahamic covenant because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what does this word partakers mean? What does this mean that we have become partakers? Paul will explain that to us later on in the book. It's best when you study the Bible to let the same author interpret himself. And so Paul, in Romans 15, towards the end of the book, verses 25 through 27, as he is raising money for the suffering saints in Jerusalem, says this. He says, But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. So Paul is raising up uh, an offering, if you will, for the suffering saints in 
Jerusalem. And Paul says, you Gentiles, as I petition you for money, are obligated to do this. Why are you obligated? Because (laughs) you're indebted to the Jews. Well, why? For if the Gentiles have shared in spiritual things, they are indebted to them to minister to them material things. Give them money. Why? Because... You, as a wild olive branch, have been grafted into their tree. You have been grafted into the Abrahamic covenant. Consequently, you are these wild branches that have been brought in. You are in a place of spiritual blessing because you have trusted in Jesus Christ or Yeshua, which is a Jewish name for Jesus. And you are in this place of spiritual blessing. So when Paul in Romans 11 verse 17 says we are partakers, that in essence is what he is talking about. It's talking about the, if I can use a fancy word, soteriological, which means salvation, soteriological benefits that we have received because we have been grafted into the Abrahamic covenant. We have received so much. We have received salvation. We have received the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have received the forgiveness of our sins. We have received a relationship with God. Why is that? Because we are these wild branches that have been brought into the stream of blessing. Now, it's very important to get this straight because, as I've mentioned many times from this pulpit, The majority view within Christianity over the last 2,000 years is that the Gentile-dominated church is not a partaker in the tree. We have taken over the tree. And that's a doctrine that we call replacement theology. Replacement theology is the idea that the church is the new Israel. The church is in that place of blessing. And God is never going to bring the natural branches back. The church has replaced Israel. Hence the name replacement theology. We have taken over all of the promises. Not just the soteriological ones. We've taken over the land promises. The borders promises. And all of those promises, which in the Old Testament are very literal, in the mind of a replacement theologian, get spiritualized and brought over into the church. One of the very interesting things about the Old Testament is when God was at work with Israel, he promised them blessings and he promised them curses. Read Deuteronomy 28 and you'll see that very clearly. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 15, are blessings for obedience. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68, are curses for disobedience. And a funny thing goes on with this replacement theology. Only Israel's blessings are transferred to the church. Somehow the curses get left with them. And when I study Deuteronomy 28, and I see the requirements that God put on Israel for blessing as given in the Mosaic Covenant, I, for one, am very grateful that we are not Israel or the new Israel. So we are partakers, not taker-overs of the tree. Now, based on this teaching, Paul now moves in verse 18 to a very strong warning against Gentile pride. And notice what he says here in verse 18. He says, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Verse 18a, the first part of the verse, is an exhortation against arrogance towards those natural branches that have been broken off. In other words, the branches there in red become arrogant towards the branches at the bottom, I think I meant to say, left side of the screen that have been broken off. It's very interesting to me that when replacement theologians argue their point, they always appeal to theology, they appeal to hermeneutics, 
which is the science and art of biblical interpretation. And yet Paul says in verse 18, the root problem is pride. It has very little to do with your method of interpretation. Method of interpretation has a lot to say about it. But it is rooted in an arrogance in the Gentile heart which says we are now in the place of blessing and God is never, ever going to bring Israel back into the fold. Replacement theology has more to do with an attitude of the heart than any other single thing. Now, as we move into the second part of verse 18, Paul now begins to explain the reason why we as Gentile Christians should not be arrogant towards the natural branches which have been broken off. Why is it that we should not be arrogant towards unbelieving Jews? Why is it that we should not look down upon unbelieving Jews? Notice what he says in the second part of verse 18. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Why should we continue to have an attitude of respect and not condescension, not arrogance, not pride towards unbelieving Jews? Paul's answer is God began his redemptive program through Israel and not the Gentiles. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. God took this man, Abram, told him to walk by faith. Through this man, Abram, would come a great nation called the Jewish nation that God would raise up. And through that nation, the stream of blessing would flow to planet Earth. God said to Abram in Genesis 12:3, And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, why did God choose to do it that way? Because he's God. And he made a decision to work that way. He decided to bless planet Earth spiritually and one day physically through the coming kingdom. But he decided to usher in those blessings through a chosen group called the Jews or the nation of Israel. Now, look at ourselves here in Sugarland, Texas in the year 2011. Look at all of our spiritual blessings that we have. And there is not a single spiritual blessing that you presently possess that did not come to you through the Jewish nation. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which reveal the principle of the walk of faith, those guys were Jewish. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, which is a perfect revelation of God's character, telling us what God is like. The Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law came to us through the Jewish nation. The prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and all of their teachings have come to us through the Jewish nation. Nation. Every author of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, with the possible exception of Luke, was a Jew. A physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, the very Scripture came to us through the Jews. Romans 3 and verse 2 tells us that to them, referring to the Jews, Romans 3, 2, has been given the oracles of God. We would not have this book in our hands to even teach from, preach from, or read had it not been for God's work through the nation of Israel. And of course, how could I leave out Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah? The very Messiah that we celebrated this morning at the Lord's table. This Messiah who stepped out of eternity into time and absorbed the wrath of God in our place. He was as Jewish as they come. In fact, study the Gospels and you will find Jesus Christ continually going to A, the temple, or B, to Jerusalem to participate in the Jewish feasts. 
Why would he do that? Because that's what Jews did. Jesus was a Jew. Look at the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 very carefully. And you will see Matthew tracing Christ's lineage back, not just to David, but all the way back to Abraham. In fact, the early church that suffered so much for the cause of Christ, that transferred to the next generation Christian truth, that apostolic generation that ran their race, they ran their lap, and they passed the baton of truth off to the second generation. That first generation of Christians that suffered martyrdom after martyrdom after martyrdom, that generation was Jewish primarily. It starts to become Gentile about Acts 10 and then Acts 13. But my point is simply this. There is no blessing that we have today that did not come to us through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And thus, Paul can say, it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So therefore, you should not and we should not develop an attitude of disrespect derision, arrogance, pride, and condescension to those natural branches that have been broken off. It's a very strong exhortation against Gentile pride. Well, how has the church done following this exhortation in the last 2,000 years? May I just say that the grade I would give the church looking at the last 2,000 years is an F-. minus. We could not have flunked the test more than what we have done in our attitude towards the Jews in the last 2,000 years. I want to throw a quote up here. And let's play the game of who said it, shall we? By the way, this comes from a written tract. And generally you attach greater weight to what somebody writes than what they say orally. Because when they're writing, they are calmly, coolly reflecting upon what's actually going on in their mind. First, their synagogue should be set on fire. Second, their home should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under the threat of death to teach anymore. Fifthly, their passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Sixthly, they ought to be stopped from usury, which is charging interest on loans. Seventh, let the young And strong Jews and Jewishes be given the flail, the axe, the hoe, the spade, the distaff, the spindle, and let them earn their bread by the sweat of their noses. Now, you see the italics between these sentences? In other words, I left out a lot of stuff here. We ought to drive the rascally lazy bones out of our system. Therefore, away with them. To sum up, dear princes and nobles who have Jews in your domains, if this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable, devilish burden, the Jews. So here's our choices. Was that written by Adolf Hitler? Was that written going to the bottom of the screen by the leader of Iran, Ahmadinejad? Was that written by the late Saddam Hussein? Well, the answer is none of the above, because it's written by the guy in the upper right, to your upper right, none other than Martin Luther. A tremendous theologian, by the way. A man who made tremendous contributions to Christianity, a man that I respect. And yet, because the Jews were obstinate towards his gospel of salvation by faith alone, in his later years, he wrote a very angry, vindictive track 
called, the bottom, the name of it is at the bottom of the screen, concerning the Jews and their lives. Was there a good side to Martin Luther? Of course. But there was a very dark side to Martin Luther as well. And this stands as a very strong warning to us. I know that there's a very positive side to my personality, but I know in my sinful nature there's a dark side. And I can say things and develop thoughts and philosophies out of anger that are completely contrary to God and his word. If it could happen to Luther, it could happen to me, it could happen to you. Do you remember uh, Peter? who made in Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi the confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the blessings that Jesus bestowed upon Peter that he be given the keys to the kingdom and all of these promises. Upon his confession, the church would be built. And then in the next breath, Peter tries to talk Jesus out of going to the cross And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, what? Satan. One minute his mouth is used for God. The next minute his mouth is used as a pulpit for the adversary. This is what happened to Luther. Historians will tell you that what Luther laid in Germany theologically was the philosophical basis for subsequent generations to come and to develop a philosophy of anti-Semitism against the Jews. Adolf Hitler, most historians believed, was a great student of some of Luther's writings. What you believe theologically about some of these subjects Don't ever think that what you believe about these things and what you think about these things and what you teach about these things does not have some kind of socio-political ramification. We can trace the Third Reich right back to Martin Luther. In fact, many people believe that Hitler used these very words in his various anti-Semitic rants and speeches against the Jews. If I could recommend to you a very good book, you can get it for cheap on Amazon, paperback. You get it for about five bucks. It's about 200 pages. It's a very easy read. And it's called Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. And the author is Michael Brown. In this particular book, he interacts with primary sources, quoting theologian after theologian after theologian, beginning with the very beginning of the church age and going right up to the present time of individuals who have made similar statements against the Jews. How has the church done in 2,000 years? Regarding Romans 11, verse 18. Do not be arrogant towards the branches that have been broken off. For if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. How has the church done in terms of understanding that every blessing we have has come to us through Israel, the Jewish people, And they are not in a permanent state of unbelief. They are in a temporal state of unbelief. And even in their state of unbelief, we should not develop arrogance and pride and condescension towards them. How have we done? F minus. And this book by Michael Brown shows it very clearly. In fact, even as I am speaking, and I'm not going to give you the name of the denomination, but there is a mainline Christian denomination that has formally entered into a boycott of the state of Israel. Those are Christians engaging in a boycott of the nation of Israel. An astounding development, particularly in light of Romans chapter 11, verse 18. Now, there are some Christians that go to the opposite end of the spectrum. And they say, you know what, the Jews have suffered so much, we're not even going to tell them about the hell that awaits them if they reject Jesus. 
And so what has developed in the eyes of some is a mindset that Israel is saved their own way and the rest of us are saved through Jesus Christ. May I just say that that is the ultimate form of anti-Semitism. Not giving to the Jew what they need to enter into a relationship with God. Because all people, Gentile or Jew, will come to God the Father through God the Son, or they will not come. But what Paul is specifically commenting here on is the attitude that should be in our hearts towards the Jews, even in their state of unbelief. He specifically says, do not be arrogant towards them. Now, notice, if you will, verses 19 through 21, we now have a warning against a Gentile misconception. We've had a warning against Gentile pride, verse 18. Now we have a warning against Gentile misconception. Notice what he says in verse 18. You will say then, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Now the natural branches are the Jews. Broken off is a reference to unbelief. The wild branches being brought in are the Gentiles. Grafted in is, we're grafted in at the point of faith. Paul says in verse 20, quite right. In other words, you get an A plus on that part of your theology test. You've got that one correct. But what has happened is you've taken a right premise and drawn from it a wrong conclusion. You're in a misconception. And the misconception is given there in the second part of verse 20. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. The whole issue here is faith. You'll notice in the second part of verse 20, unbelief. That's a reference to the natural branches, the Jews that have been broken off. You'll notice in verse 20 the words or the concept of faith. That's the idea of the wild branches or the Gentiles that have been brought in. This is a absolute reality. We are these wild branches that have been brought in as a consequence of Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ, as a consequence of the natural branches being broken off, we are those branches of unnatural origin that have been brought in. And Paul specifically says there, at the end of verse 20, he says, Do not be conceited, but fear. Now, why would he say that? Look at verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If God can reject the majority of Israel because of unbelief, then one day he will reject you if you also wander into unbelief. Because the issue with God is faith. God's whole program and our right relationship with him is built around faith. If the Jews will not honor the principle of faith, they are broken off. Similarly, if the Gentiles will not honor the principle of faith, they are broken off. Now, we have to be very careful with verse 21 and verse 22. Because if you misunderstand verse 21 and verse 22, it looks like you can lose your salvation. I am convinced that Paul here is not talking about a potential loss of salvation. Why do I say that? Because the same man that wrote this also wrote Romans 8. Romans 8 verses 31 through 38 is the strongest set of verses in the New Testament on the concept of eternal security. Once saved, always saved. In fact, Paul in Romans 8 says that our security is so sure and so secure that God already looks on us as if we are in a state of glorification. So if Paul were to teach in verses 21 and 22 that you as a wild branch can lose your salvation, he would be contradicting what he said in Romans 8. 
There's a second reason why verses 21 and 22 are not talking about a loss of salvation, and this has to do with Greek exegesis. I am the type of preacher and teacher that will not bring up Greek just to bring it up. But I will bring it up when it relates to something pertinent in the passage. And something is going on here in verse 21 and verse 22 in the Greek language. The word you that's in verse 21, towards the very end of verse 21, and also twice in verse 22, the word you, Y-O-U, the second person pronoun you, is not plural in those verses. Plural means Paul would be addressing many individual Christians that are already in faith. But the you is singular, meaning that Paul is addressing the Gentiles as a whole. He is not talking here about individual Christians who are already saved. Rather, what he is talking about is the relative position of the Jews and the Gentiles as a group, as a unit, as a whole, in the stream of divine blessing. We are currently in the stream of divine blessing because we have been, as wild branches, brought into that tree. And yet, Paul says, If the Gentiles as a unit, if the Gentiles as a whole, stop honoring the principle of faith, just as the Jews did, then they will no longer enjoy the central place of spiritual blessing in God's program. If the Gentiles as a whole turn from the gospel, Just as the nation of Israel had done, they will no longer enjoy the place, the central place of divine blessing in the program of God. This unique position that we have as wild branches being brought in, this age that we are currently in, this age of Gentile predominance in the church, this age of Gentile blessing, this age where the blessings of God have been poured out upon the Gentile peoples as never before. If the Gentiles should ever reach a point in their thinking where they will not come to God by way of faith alone, then God says you will be removed from the tree And those natural branches that are in unbelief, once they embrace the principle of faith, will be brought back in. And it will happen so fast, you won't even know what hit you. So it is not talking here about a potential loss of individual salvation. The Arminian perspective that once you're saved, you can lose your salvation, builds much of their argument from Romans 11, verses 21 and 22, because at first glance it looks that way. But there are two reasons why this is not teaching a loss of salvation. Number one, if Paul was teaching a loss of salvation here, he would contradict what he said in Romans 8. Number two, if Paul was teaching a loss of Gentile salvation here, he would not use the singular. He would use the plural speaking to many. Instead, what the Apostle Paul is talking about, excuse me, I think I said that wrong. Yeah, he would use the plural rather than the singular if he was talking about a loss of salvation. Hopefully that came out right. I'm always available afterwards for questions. Sometimes my gift of ambiguity can take over discussion like this. Paul's simple point is if the Gentiles as a whole turn from the gospel just as national Israel had done, they will no longer enjoy that central place of blessing in God's program. Paul is not speaking here of individual believers who are already Christians. And so Paul concludes our thoughts, and with this we're finished. Verse 22. Behold... The kindness and severity of God. 
To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. You'll notice the word severity. Israel entered a time of discipline and severity because of unbelief. Severity. And then he goes on and he talks about the kindness. The Gentiles, Gentile believers, entered into a time period of kindness from God because they honored the principle that salvation comes by faith alone, by Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. The whole issue is faith. God is not playing favorites here. He is simply honoring those who honor his son. Right now, the Jews aren't doing it, by and large. So they are in that place of severity from God. The Gentiles, by and large, are doing it. So they have moved into that place of kindness and blessing from God. But Gentile unbelief will lead to severity from God just as Jewish unbelief had done as well. It's a very interesting thing. You will either experience kindness from God or severity from God based on whether you come to God by way of faith. If you come to God by way of faith, the kindness begins to spill over. If you reject the principle of coming to God by faith, suddenly God becomes very severe. That's why the Gentile church is currently in that place of blessing and the Jewish nation is currently in the place of severity. In the place of severity, but God still has not forgotten them, as we will see next week as we move into verses 23, 24, and beyond. Shall we pray? Father, we remain grateful grateful for this uh, teaching concerning the nation of Israel. How it reminds us that you have not forgotten your promises, but it's also a severe warning to us in terms of our attitude towards the Jews and in terms of continually honoring your principle of faith. I ask, Lord, that these thoughts and Ideas would be foremost on our minds as we move into the new year. May we be a people here, Lord, at Sugarland Bible Church that honors you and consequently experiences kindness from you. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. See, if you were in a normal church, you would have heard a sermon this morning on, you know, let's... Live for the Lord in the year 2012 or something like that. But because you're in an abnormal church, we gave you a teaching here on anti-Semitism and all sorts of related subjects. Don't blame me, by the way. Blame the Bible because I'm just going through the Word of God. But just by way of exhortation, severity and kindness. Severity and kindness. There are people... Perhaps here this morning, well, now it's this afternoon, who perhaps are not right with the God who made them. Why is that? Because they've never entered into faith alone in Jesus Christ. And consequently, with God, you are in a place of severity. And yet the gospel is so clear, it's such a wonderful concept, it is indeed good news that that severity can be changed to kindness from God. Wouldn't you rather experience kindness from God than severity? And you can do that uh, even as I'm speaking, by trusting in Jesus Christ. Placing your hope, trust, confidence for the safekeeping of your soul into this man, Jesus Christ. Believing His promises. And the moment you do that, you change from a place of severity to a place of kindness.
And if that's something that you're interested in doing, and that's something that you want to do, it's something you can do right now in the quietness of your own heart as the Holy Spirit is convicting you. Simply trust in the provision of the gospel and enter 2012 into a place of kindness from God rather than severity. If there's questions in your mind about how to do that and you want more information, I'm available after the service to talk. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. With one New Year's resolution. What could that New Year's resolution be? I think one of our goals in, at Sugarland Bible Church is to make this church the friendliest church that it can possibly be. Coming in and out of church to a new church is an intimidating experience. And a lot of people come in here and they kind of slip through the cracks. Nobody uh, greets them. Nobody reaches out to them. And I think we can reverse that very easily through one New Year's resolution. Simply on your way out, resolve yourself to greet someone that you don't know, or perhaps you don't know that well, someone you haven't seen for a while, and just shake their hand and say, I'm really glad that you're here. Isn't that a pretty good resolution to have as a church? I think we can pull that one off. God bless you. You're dismissed.